Oppenheimer 2023 movie review and thoughts. So yeah, uh, this I'm gonna start by telling you this was a movie I absolutely loved. I I'm not sure there's gonna be any jokes in this video. Um, I will definitely get into some serious topics. Before I get any further, first of all, please watch this movie. Second of all, make sure you watch it in a the theater. Um, yeah, I think the, the the biggest screen with the best sound system, this is this absolutely deserves it. And yeah. Um, yes, so realize this video is long. I'm doing what I can to make it worth your time. I start the video with a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so. Hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead and choose even lower my index finger. As soon as the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers and I will be discussing the ending. So, this movie is rated R. It's the first R rated Nolan movie since Insomnia and. I will admit that at first, you know, I, I'm one of those people, I don't, I think you should go for the rating that you think makes most sense for your movie. You know, if you're, if you feel like your vision can, can handle, you know, maybe trimming down some stuff, if the MPA are giving you a hard time, you know, do so. If you feel like the the movie, you know, yeah, movies about a uh, you know the development of atomic bomb. It's it's it makes a lot of sense for it to be R rated. At first, you know, for for a while, the movie doesn't necessarily show something that it feels like. You know, you, you can you can see how it got an R rating, but at first, you might be like. Was that necessary? Did that have to be in the movie? But I would say by the end of the movie, I'm not gonna tell tell you when it'll when it dawned on me personally. But by the end, but before the end credits started rolling, I was 100% on board with. I think it makes total sense for this to be an R rating. Please don't take your kids to unless you hate them. I guess. Um, I just, I don't know if it'll be worth, I mean, you're going to be paying for some of the therapy bills. I, I hope you realize, okay, yeah, didn't get very far. There's going to be jokes in this video. Um, yeah, I'll just, I'll very briefly talk about, there's, you know, I'm going to briefly go by the, the parent, the IMDb parents guide. It does a, a good job. Sex and nudity is rated as moderate, and I agree, and I think, you know, by... I think it does make sense. Uh, violence and gore is rated as mild and yeah, it's it's definitely not as yeah. Um, moderate profanity, mild alcohol, drugs, and smoking, severe, frightening, and intense scenes. That's very very much the case. And again, you know, it's about the atomic bomb. This is not. You know, it's it's not some tiny, you know, whatever thing. It, you know, I I gave Nolan a hard time for making Dunkirk PG thirteen. I don't think an I don't think an anti war movie should be less than an R rating. I don't think it makes sense. I don't think you can communicate how awful war is on less than an R rating. Um. I'm really glad that he, uh, you know, honestly, I'll, I'll, I'll take credit for it. You're welcome, everyone. This movie, sh you know, make it makes sense for this movie to be an R. I'm, I'm really glad that Nolan saw my movies on Dunkirk and and decided based purely on that. No, um, let's see. But, but yeah, this is absolutely like there's, you know, there's some R-rated movies where I'm like, okay, you could have toned that down. It would have been fine. You just you're doing this because you want three edgy five me teenagers to sneak into your movie and you want some credit you are you're like I'm not making kids movies here your movie could have been PG-13 this movie absolutely not I you know I 100% I can see how you could trim it down and I'm so glad 
that he didn't. You know, this is not like, you know, there's some R-rated movies where it's like, yeah, there's no way. Like, uh, Showgirls, not sure how you would at all edit that down. There's like constant sex and swearing and, and nudity and so, so, you know. But, but yeah, this movie, I could see how they could have trimmed it out. And I'm really, really glad they did. I, I, I hope Nolan from here on out is going to go like case by case basis. Because I feel like if he had been, Dunkirk would have been an R rating. But I'm going to move on from that now. Let's see. So, yeah, the. Um, yeah, uh, I've watched the movie once. I just got back from the theater. Um, let's see. So, so, yeah, it's still very fresh in my mind. And. Yeah, uh, so yes, the plot, um, I'm going to be quoting IMDb here, the story of American scientist J. Robert Oppenheimer and his role in the development of the atomic bomb. And I would expand on, basically the movie goes, this is not a spoiler, you learn immediately, uh, you know, it's basically, it has a similar structure as far as structural editing, to, you know, chronologically goes as the prestige you know I'm not gonna give away you know there's a there's something you learn at the start of the prestige that I don't think you should know before going into that movie so I'm not gonna say exactly but what we have is you know something important either has happened or is happening we go back in time to before that happened you know, so, so yeah we have that we have the present day and we have something before the present day and another thing that's also before. And we cut between these three different times, you know. And, yeah, I'm really, really glad. You know, it didn't feel like he was just repeating himself. It's a very different movie in a lot of other ways than, you know, The Prestige. But, but yeah, I'm really, really glad that he went with this, you know, and, and yes, I acknowledge Dunkirk also does something similar. In my opinion, The Prestige and this movie do it much, much better than Dunkirk does. And, yeah, so, Nolan is one of those directors where, like, honestly, like, if he put family, like, like, vacation you know video if he if if that hit theaters yeah i would probably pay to see it but this was one where like from right away like the moment i heard you know i i heard okay he's doing oppenheimer next like the moment that i heard that i was like wait are you sure that's nolan is that not like because it doesn't it doesn't sound like the kind of thing, you know like this is it's a yeah, by the two of the genres, according to IMDb, and I agree with them, are biography and history. The third is drama. This is literally the first biography film he's done. You know, there there are filmmakers who who will take on like, you know, the the like I was I was less surprised when I heard that John Carpenter did a biography film, you know, he did one on Elvis, so, but, but just, yeah, and, and, like, history, you know, this and Dunkirk, I think, are the only history ones he's made, so, you know, it's, it's incredibly different, um, and, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad, I always admire when someone is willing to step outside of their comfort zone, and, for sure, there's some very Nolan-y stuff going on here, but, like, it's it's very, very different in in some really significant ways. And... Let's see... Yeah, uh, before I get into the details, um, incredible technical aspects, you know, it's Nolan. Just tremendous talent, skill, and enthusiasm on display. And yeah, um, right. So this was, yeah, this was written by Nolan uh, by himself. And it's based on the book by 
Kai Bird and Martin Sherwin. And I'm not sure. Yeah, there's not a whole lot other. Like, Martin was, in, in addition to, to writing the book for this, Martin was advised, he was a consultant on The Day After Trinity from 1981, which also about Oppenheimer since Trinity, that was the test site. And an episode of a 2009 show called American Experience. Yeah, documentaries on American history. Uh, Kai Bird has written a book called The Good Spy, which is now in pre-production for adaptation. Other than that, that's, you know, yeah, as far as, far as IMDb is concerned, that's that's it for, for them. Um... Yeah, uh, this is this is really really well written. Um, there's a lot of character. There's a, there were a lot of people involved, uh, you know, in in the development of the atomic bomb. It wasn't just Oppenheimer by himself. There's a lot of people in this, and some of the a, a number of the characters will just appear fairly briefly and it is basically you know and and some of them like will will very briefly meet and then they send Oppenheimer on to meet someone else you know they tell him okay you should talk to this person in this place you know and then he goes there and that means that there are a number of scenes of people meeting other people and I'm really impressed with how well Nolan handled, because that could get so tedious, you know, but each time there's something really significant there, you know, so, yeah, um, every character that we spend any amount of time with is sufficiently interesting, uh, but yeah, I would definitely say, like, you know, the cast is amazing. We all love the cast. Try not to get too hyped up about seeing this, that, or the other actor in the, the movie because some of them are not in as much of it as, you know, we, we had maybe hoped. Uh, I wouldn't say that anyone is wasted. There's actually, there's a couple that I really loved seeing again and I really felt like, you know, did a they they did a really great job what's the word um you know they they brought out those the the trademark qualities you know certain actors uh, so yeah it was it was super cool to see some of these people again some of them I haven't seen anything made in the last, I don't know, 20 years or so, and it's it's super cool to see them again, to see that they still absolutely have the, the talent. And now, um, yeah, the movie handles plot twists quite well. Uh, you spend a good chunk of the movie trying to figure out certain things, and... Or, you know, if you know the history very, you know, then then you're just sitting there waiting to see if they actually followed the, the facts or not. So, the, yeah, um, I'm going to talk some about Christopher Nolan's direction. So I'm just briefly going to, you know, rank all films directed by Christopher Nolan other than this one. At the end of the review, I'll update the ranking with this one. But, yeah. Ranking all of them, these are purely for the ones he's directed. You know, it's I'm not including any that he helped write but didn't direct. Ranked worst to best, following is the only that I haven't watched. Dunkirk is the only that I don't love, so it probably won't surprise you that Dunkirk is at the bottom. And yeah, I in my opinion, the chronological editing jumps between the planes, the ships, and the soldiers ruin the momentum, especially the emotional momentum. Insomnia is somewhat low because while it definitely holds up, you know, it's aged extremely well. It is very clearly early stage, Nolan. 
you know, it's it's kind of like you know, if if you like sit back down with uh, uh, an old video game that you really love and you've been used to, but you know, yeah, like uh, let's say you like myself love Prince of Persia. You know, I can I can sit down and play the original 1989 Prince of Persia anytime, and still have a blast. But if I've recently been playing one of the, you know, one of the Prince of Persia games made after the year 2002, you know, I'm gonna be like, oh wow, I kind of miss that feature. And that you know, it's that. It's not bad. It's it's still amazing, but it's just not quite. You know. If, like it's basically if if you you know it's Nolan so it's better than a lot of other directors at their absolute peak but you know it's not the best Nolan next is Memento low because it is a tad too contrived for its own good Batman Begins is low because it is in way too much of a hurry The Dark Knight Rises just is not quite as solid as the top picks Interstellar, not higher because it's schmaltzy. The Dark Knight is so near the top because it is basically completely flawless. Like, you know, yeah, Dark Knight and the rest, and, and the ones I'm about to mention, are basically flawless. Like, I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to, like, put, put in the comments if you think, you know, here's a major flaw with the Dark Knight or one of the, I swear I'm not going to, freak out about it. I'm, I'm perfectly happy to d discuss uh, Nolan. Inception, one of the most emotionally engaging, a legitimately fun heist film on the surface, and an excellent metaphor for the creative process, especially filmmaking. The Prestige is an incredibly effective exploration of obsession, the magic, and how the tricks grow is some of the most fun that Nolan has making these and yeah, um, Tenet at the, you know, I'm not going to say if it's still at the top, but before this movie, it was definitely at the top. Genuinely the very best spy action thriller that I've watched out of the more than 60, worth, 60 years worth of them that I've seen. And though I certainly didn't understand it the first time I watched it, I absolutely felt almost everything that Nolan wanted me to. And that's the, you know, Nolan likes making puzzle movies. He likes making movies that are about something else, where he, he uses them, you know, he uses his films to explore something completely different. You know, Inception is in part a, a great metaphor for filmmaking. You know, there I'm, I'm not going to break it down. Other people have done a really great job of saying, well, that's the, you know, that person, the director, that's the screenwriter, that's the casting director, you know, every, every single, you know, and in this movie, you know, yeah, like, if you look completely at the surface level, this is about Oppenheimer working on developing the atomic bomb and the sort of, and, that, and this is something I really appreciate, not a, not a spoiler, because it actually, it starts very early on, it also goes into, well, what next? You know, this is not one of those, like, if this movie had been made in, like, 1943 or something, it would have been, and then Oppenheimer made the bomb. Yes! We're the heroes. We're the good guys. That's not what Nolan is interested in here in the slightest. Like, don't, not even for a second. This is not a rah-rah kind of thing, you know. It's actually, oh my god, I'm just very briefly, I swear I'm not going to spend forever on it, but it's all... Someone in 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 a user review say you know the quote a line from the movie and say really Nolan and it's like I'm I'm sorry some people have terrible media literacy Nolan is not saying that he agrees with that thing it is an idea believed by some of his characters he's just saying like if anything Nolan like in some of these movies is like ridiculously conservative like Dark Knight Rises like holy crap that movie does not have a high opinion of the Occupy Wall Street movement anyway um but yeah you know if you go you know if you dig a little deeper this movie is not just about the the literal you know actual you know it has a lot of facts 
actual factual description of the, the development of the atomic bomb, it's also about escalation. It's about that if you if you you know do the you know because at like at the start of the movie it's also you know they're already dealing with you know bef yeah before they start talking about nukes it's already like well World War Two you know what are we gonna do we have to win this and and it is you know the the uh, with s some movies like to to just get a uh, um. A really distant look at it and and kind of say you know today we know better and that can be very appealing I'm not gonna pretend that I never get that way about things but it is extremely important to remember the people who helped develop the atomic bomb which to be clear I I don't think you know I I pretty much think that violence should always be the absolute last resort you know, and even threats of violence shouldn't be used more than absolutely necessary. But they did actually think, you know, we know, you know, the Nazis were defeated, but, like, there was a while where, to everyone in the world, it really looked like the Nazis might win. And honestly, you know, if not for a couple of, you know, yeah, there's, there's you know, there's a lot of reasons. I th I do think... It's worth noting that among the reasons were the fact that Hitler it was a Hitler was one of the main reasons that Dunkirk you know worked out for the Allies and not the Nazis you know it was Hitler being stubborn and petty he was like these generals they're they're deciding too many things I want to decide something I'm gonna do this and he completely blew it and yeah so you know and i don't i don't say that to to make light of nazism and you know which is today still a threat i say it in part to piss off in case there are any nazis watching and in case anyone's watching who's who hates nazis as much as i do who wants something to throw in the face of neo nazis so but but yeah at the time, they were really scared of what might happen. And, yeah, it, in part, the movie's about escalation. And, you know, today it's not nukes, it's drones. You know, like, remember when drones were just like this thing? You know, oh, you know, very, very careful, just a few, you know. And it just, it got bigger and bigger. Like, Obama used an absurd amount of drones. And I forget, I think Trump managed to to top that you know but the, the 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 one obama achievement that he didn't mind contributing to um that he didn't want to just undo i forget about biden i'm not i don't know if he's escalated i wouldn't be surprised certainly i'm almost 100% certain he didn't like dramatically decrease it which as far as I understand, I will admit it's been a little while since I looked at the numbers, but as far as I understand, there's great reason to, to hugely decrease use of drones. Uh, you know, and, and yeah, like the, the, yeah, it's, it's the, the, and, and the movie also gets into political manipulation. There's a character in this who is hoping to, to get elected. And it is not difficult to see, I mean, I don't know if Trump, Trump is probably, you know, Trump, Trump bungled his way into office. He wasn't a master manipulator the way that the character in the movie, which is, you know, yeah, the person in the movie is based on a real life person. And as far as I understand, they didn't particularly, like, they didn't go crazy with, oh, let's make him, you know. No, that was apparently what he really was like. Um, but the, yeah, uh, I maybe more, a Ron DeSantis, uh, I, I think, would make uh, a decent, you know. But, but yeah, 
it's not saying you can't trust any politician. It's saying if you know the, the basic the thing that they do is we see him talk to people that he doesn't that he's convinced won't share the the things he says. There's a number of politicians today. We see what they say when they know that they're on camera, they're on mic. We don't necessarily know, we, we certainly don't know everything that happens behind closed doors. And this movie's basically saying, well, you know, this guy, what he did in front of cameras and, and on microphone sure is similar to these current, present-day politicians. And here's what this guy said behind closed doors. Maybe that's also what, what they're saying, you know. So, extremely relevant. And, and just, yeah, really, really love. Uh, let's see. Um, now, it is... Right, the, the, yes. So, for more than 15 years by now, upwards of 20, Nolan has been able to attract amazing casts. Even so, this is still a truly incredible cast. Like he has a and he has an act for casting against type, redefining actors by getting performances out of them that we're not used to seeing. Like how Al Pacino is so low key in Insomnia. In this respect, Nolan is similar to Quentin Tarantino and sometimes Martin Scorsese. I'm not certain if I would say. I mean, I I will admit I don't watch all of Matt Damon's stuff these days. I will definitely say that he, there were definitely times where he was very different from the kind of really charming, you know, yeah, we're, we're used to him being very, very charming. I, um, yeah, maybe, um, he unfortunately doesn't appear, uh, you know, he doesn't have the, the biggest uh, amount of screen time. But, um, Gary Oldman, I don't think I've seen him give a performance quite like the one he gives here in quite some time. It actually, yeah, it, it somewhat reminds me of something you'd see from him in, like, the 90s, so that's very, very cool. And it's, you know, I, yeah, I'm glad they keep working together. Um, you know, they haven't worked together as much, but, you know, yeah, three Batman movies and now this, and... You know, and it's one of those things, like, the moment that someone casts the same person multiple times, it's like, is this just nepotism? Are they just, like, cutting off potential work from Because, like, if you get one really solid performance with a really big director, you can build on that. You can get other parts based on that. But if you keep working with that one director, you know, you're, you're removing access for actors who are similar to you who could play the the role you know but but yeah it it legitimately it doesn't feel like he's just bringing people back for for no good reason actually yeah the thing about it i i would maybe also say casey affleck i it felt different from a number of other yeah um, I think I will just very briefly, I really loved seeing Dane DeHaan again. Uh, not the biggest role, but a, a significant, you know, an important one, at least. And I've, I've always, I've said since the first time I saw him, this guy should be, you know, he should have a massive career because he's so freaking talented, you know. Uh, I guess Chronicle was the first thing I saw him in, or wait, was he in, um, was that after, yeah, Chron yeah, yeah, Chronicle, you know, he's, he's amazing in that, and, you know, I still think that he made a very good Harry Osborn, um, yeah, he's, he's really, really solid here, it, the, you know, it's the thing of, just 
like he'll he'll tolerate things for so for only for so long and then he starts making some moves and just the his his face like i'm sure he is a very nice person in real life a lot of these actors who play ver very scary unpleasant people actually are you know it's you don't want to scare the casting director you want to scare the audience and and just yeah he's he's so Oh, you just, you hate his guts, and, and love to hate him, you know. Um, great to see, um, the, uh, hold on, I had his name. Um, Desmaltian, what's his first name again? Um, David, David Desmaltian, who, you know, it's, like, if it's been, um, if it's been a minute, you might have forgotten, but, like, he really, like, everyone noticed him in The Dark Knight. You know, now he's had all these other roles, so you don't necessarily think of that, but, yeah. Um, yeah, it was actually, he, he did play patron number one, an uncredited role, in an episode of early edition in the year 2000, but other than that, yeah, Dark Knight is the very first role of his, and yeah, it's great to see them working together again, and just, yeah, he gets he gets such good work out of, yeah. Um, I don't have a lot to say about Matthew Modine. I'm, I'm always glad to see him. It's, it's one of those things where, like, his career kind of went south after... The 80s, and it's like, I mean, he was, he was really good in the 80s. It, it's not his fault that, like, but, um, yeah, I, I, that was Olivia Thurlby. I thought I recognized, cool. Um, I'll definitely say, I, this, I believe this is the first time I see Rami Malik in something. Yes, I know, I know, uh, you know, I have some homework to do there, but, if you're a really big fan of his, you know, he does have some really significant stuff, but it's a while before he gets to, to really shine, and, you know, but, but yeah, um, yeah, really, really cool to see him, um, all right, Jack Quaid, good to see him, Josh Peck, um, let's see, yeah, that's, Pretty much all of them. Yeah, uh, Florence Pugh continues to really impress me. Um, you know, I mean, to me, when I think of her, I primarily think of Yelena Belova. But she's really great here as well. And it is this thing of, like, it's a very different character. Dylan Arnold is, is great as well. I like seeing Josh Hartnett is is very surreal. Knowing that Josh Hartnett was in talks for Batman and turned it down, then regretted it, and now he's sharing scenes with the with Scarecrow, you know, the guy who played Scarecrow in those movies, and and yeah, they might have been playing that. Right, Ted King, very cool to see him again in something. Uh, I guess. Prison Break was probably the last time I saw him in anything. Kenneth Branagh, I thought that Kenneth Branagh was going to be in more of the movie, considering, you know, how big, like, he's he's really, really significant in Tenet. But, yeah, he's, he's, he's good, and, you know, I don't want to brag, but I am a certified Danish person. And, yes, the accent is pretty good. It's... It's not the best I've heard. I don't. I'm not 100% sure why he didn't just cast one of the incredibly well-known Danish actors. Some of whom have not been able to. I mean, I'm not saying it had to be like Mads Mikkelsen, Lars Mikkelsen, Ulrich Thompson. Thompson. <sighs> Nikolai Kostovaldo. You know, I'm not saying it had to be one of them. I'm just saying you have options, you know, it just, it feels a little weird to me to cast a British guy and tell him do a Danish accent instead of just uh, hiring one of the internationally famous Danish actors who speak fluent English, you know, it's not, it's, anyway. 
Um, let's see. Then we, of course, have... Right, Tony Goldwyn. Always good to see him. Jason Clark. Um, he doesn't get to, like, go... Like, at, at first he's a little bit restrained, but he gets there. Don't worry. Um, Scott Grimes. Cool to see him. Alden Ehren Ehrenreich. You know, I thought he was good in Solo, and yeah, he's he's good here. Um, yeah, Emily Blunt, always happy to see her, uh, you know, and I will talk a little bit about the last couple... Yes, so, the movie star is Killian Murphy. He's appeared in... Almost every single Nolan film, starting with Batman Begins, like, he's not an interstellar. I'm not sure he would have even fit in that. I, I guess he could have had the Wes Bentley role, but, you know, I am really glad that it's Matthew McConaughey in the lead there. I don't think Killian Murphy could nail the kind of American patriot. Not because he's not incredibly talented, he is, but that kind of thing comes very naturally to Matthew McConaughey, who deserved recognition for his acting, something... Killian already had at that time. He's not in Tenet or The Prestige. Again, not sure who he would have played. He has this quiet intensity that Nolan has used really well in the others up to this point. And yeah, um, here as well, like it's, it is a very, there's a lot of subtle uh, parts to the, the performance because he's a man who thinks and feels a lot but doesn't always put words to it. You know, and some of the time it'll like cut to what he's thinking and we'll get a very clear view. Like very early on, you have this, like he, he outright says, you know, when he was in college, he was having these overwhelming visions of a world beyond this one. And the, the yeah, you know, we get some, it doesn't, you know, in case you're, worried it doesn't persist it it after a while we get to the actual development of the bomb but very early on we get you know every so often will you know a close up of him will cut will will lead to a cut to us seeing the the world beyond which you know of course the 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 atomic bomb is the the i don't know if i want to give away exactly why that fits the world beyond thing, but I'll just say that there there is a reason there, and yeah, like he he conveys a lot in just the the just his his face and his eyes, you know, and that's the thing. Like even if you you know if you've watched a Killian Murphy performance, you notice his eyes. You know, there there are just this this piercing intense stare that he has you know it, it works incredibly well in Dunkirk as this thousand yard stare in Inception there is this thing of you know he feels like his father didn't care enough about him and and these various you know just yeah Nolan almost always uses it well use it really well here and it is this thing you know like they they say there's um I, I forget exactly who but there's there's a quote that says that to the the um, the death of one person is the death of an entire world and the atomic bomb kills significantly more than just one person and it's clear from very early in this movie that uh, as i believe is actually the case with you know people who you know who spoke to him said Oppenheimer was a conscientious person. He wasn't, you know, and that's, that's why I'm not going to get distracted. It just frustrates me that in, like, Terminator 2, there's no, like, it's just, ah, you know, you all you can do is destroy, you, you may, you know, people like you who make the atomic bombs and such, and it's like, no, Oppenheimer legitimately thought that it was the only way for one thing, keep in mind, he was certain that the Nazis would develop one. And there, you know, there's a line in this movie that may actually be something he said to someone else. Or, or, you know, they might have, like, Nolanized it, but I don't know if we can be trusted with this device 
but I know that the Nazis can't. You know, and and yeah, um, but but the but yeah, you know, he it it did greatly disturb him what he had done, and the yeah, the movie spends a good amount of time going over you know these yeah the the concerns that he had and how distraught he was afterwards you know the the i i don't actually know if there's more than that but certainly like if you've seen like footage of the real oppenheimer you've you know yeah you've very likely seen the record the the yeah where where he's you know he quotes the Bhagavad Gita and it's very clear not just from the words but also just his his face his voice you know it's it's completely destroyed him and it is this thing of you know what what now what do you do after you've done something that you feel is so monstrous and I really appreciate that the movie spends time exploring that you know, and I can't help but think, you know, you know, all of, maybe not all of, but a number of Nolan's movies are metaphors for filmmaking, for creativity, and, you know, with Interstellar, he's exploring this idea of, you know, he has to, as a father, he has to be away from his kids for a long time when making a movie, and, you know, it, it hurts, it hurts him and them. I, I feel like maybe here he's he's exploring, you know, I mean, it's not, you know, I don't think one of Nolan's movies is going to be used to, to like, um, what's the word, like, you know, to, to usher in some, some horrible thing, but it's not like no movie has ever been used to cause a lot of harm. You know, I, I believe, I want to say it was Dan Olson pointed out that the actual effect of the the Leni Riefenstahl, uh, Triumph of the Will, I believe it's called, the actual effect that had is exaggerated. That's part of the, there's a mythology about the movie. But Birth of a Nation did significant damage to race relations and yeah I, I don't think it's Nolan saying you know what if I'm like Oppenheimer but I do think he is saying you know maybe some people are like Oppenheimer you know another you know perhaps a more recent and relevant example would be Zack Snyder's 300 you know which like you know you know You, I, I, I'm not gonna say that you're like necessarily a hateful person for loving it. Maybe you just appreciate it on like a more abstract level. Which, honestly, I, I used to. I, I didn't always appreciate how much hate there is in that movie. How, how completely driven and shaped by hate it is. And, and you know, as long as like that's better. You know, if you, if you love the movie, but you don't agree with the hatred of it that's better than you loving it and agreeing with it i just i'm just going to point out that they literally did use that movie to hype up the troops you know that movie was shown to the troops before they went into the middle east you know american troops so you know the the yeah let's see Right, and I, I mentioned a bunch of the, the individual actors. They also really come together as a unit. They play off each other really well. And, yeah, Nolan is one of those directors where you can very clearly see how he's grown over the course of his career. It's a real pleasure to go back, watch his early work, because while, of course, it's not quite up to the standards that he's since come into, it really is impressive considering you can see the seeds, you you can see he was already interested in building tension using parallel action complex setups and yeah this movie shows growth there's a, I was very impressed with how like in this movie he really doesn't uh, he doesn't seem like he's 
worried that people need more than like great acting, dialogue, and direction. You know, I've I've seen some you know criticize the movie, saying, "Oh, you know, there's just a lot of of talking in this movie." And I mean, factually, yes, there is a lot of you know, yeah, yeah. There's actually hold on, yeah. A lot of this movie is people talking to each other in rooms. Like, it's not, you know, they're, they're talking, but, oh, there's also, like, a bank heist. Or they're talking, but a, a plane is being taken apart in the sky. No, they're, they're talking, and, and the, you know, there, there's a, there are some scenes that have, like, substantial tension. I mean, I mean, yeah, the movie, on the whole, is very tense. But it's usually the ideas more than, like, there's, you know, for a while, Nolan's career had a lot of, like, bad guys running around with guns and some good guys who have to try to stop them and, and that kind of thing. And this has, like, th th this isn't like that at all. And... Right, there were a couple of... Right, Matt Damon was on a break from acting as a promise to his wife with one condition. It would go on hold if Christopher Nolan called. As luck would have it, Nolan offered da Damon the role of Leslie Groves, Leslie Groves and the break went on hold. In order for the black and white sections of the movie to be shot in the same quality as the rest of the film, Kodak developed the first ever black and white film stock for IMAX, which is... Amazing. Just, yeah. Christopher Nolan revealed in a Collider interview that there are no CGI shots in the film, and having watched it, I believe him, and just, yeah, it's it's very, very impressive, the way that it's just, yeah. Um, and, yeah, so different sources say different things, but either it was, uh, let's see... Um, producer Charles Roven, who pitched the film to writer-director Christopher Nolan and Emma Thomas by telling them about the biographical book American Prometheus, which is about Oppenheimer. Um, or, you know, some, some say that it was actor Robert Pattinson who gifted, at the rap party of Tenet, gifted the American Prometheus book, but some say the book he gifted was a book of Oppenheimer speeches. Now, let's see. And, um, let's see, there was a... Right, um, second and consecutive collaboration between Christopher Nolan and composer Ludwig Göransson. You know what, I... I Ludwig Göransson. He's Swedish, so I, you know, yeah, I, I, I don't speak fluent spe Swedish or anything, but I think that's slightly closer than an American accent version. Anyway, frequent Nolan collaborator Hans Zimmer wasn't available since he was committed with the scores of Dune and Dune Part Two at the time of both Nolan films. I am really, really happy with the Gorenson score for for both of these. This is. Truly amazing. I understand why there was such a long collaboration. You know, like Nolan and Zimmer together are like Hitchcock and um, I can't believe I'm playing on his name. I talked about it just like last week. Um, the the okay, I'll have it momentarily uh, because he later did Fahrenheit. 451 from 1966 so if I search for me Bernard Herrmann you know just um, amazing together they they really but the the yeah I I this is probably the best in in my opinion best score for a Nolan film this is just absolutely astonishing the, there's this like, in an early scene, uh, Oppenheimer goes to this place where a lot of people want to hear him give a speech, 
and they're sitting on like the it's like when you when you go into the place there's like these rows and and it's like basically it's all made of wood so people you know are resting their shoes on wood and when they know he's about to to get there and give a speech to hype it up they they'll stamp in in unison in the uh, yeah and the music it that becomes one of the motifs of uh, light motifs of the music the way that the the chanting is in the dark knight rises and the escalation it just i i i i'm in awe of these people like i don't, how do you even how do you even make that leap from you know because like i it's not the first time i've seen you know I'm, I'm not sure i've experienced it personally but i've seen other stuff where they'll like you know the the They'll stamp their feet into the into the wooden floor at the same time to, to hype the things up. I've never like for that to lead into this because uh, you know yeah that really underlines escalation well and yeah just stroke of genius and uh, yeah although they previously collaborated in five other movies this is the first time Killian Murphy plays the lead in a Christopher Nolan film. And I gotta say, it's absolutely perfect. Like, I don't think any of the others... I, I get why Killian Murphy thought that he would make a good Batman. I do think Christian Bale is is better. I'm really, really glad that Murphy played... Um, I can't believe I'm playing him his name. Um, Scarecrow instead. And apparently so was Nolan, because he kept bringing him back. Uh, you know, he's, he's the only villain who appears in all three movies. Now, let's see. Right. Uh, while IMAX is frequently used as an elaborate tool for sweeping action set pieces, this biopic is filmed entirely in the format, a rarity in feature films, even by today's standards. And let's see. Right. Uh, Paul Schrader described the film as the best, most important film of this century after he attended the New York premiere of the film and yeah and let's see um, right and yeah this is the fourth collaboration between Christopher Nolan and cinematographer Hoyte van Hoytema they previously worked together on Interstellar Dunkirk and Tenet and that's another like to be clear I love Nolan's work with Wally Feinster. I do think they, they're just amazing, incredible cinematographer, incredible work on those movies. But I... Ugh. Hoyte does such an amazing job. Like, it's not a spoiler to say that, yes, this film does, of course, feature at least one shot of... An atomic bomb blowing up. Like you'd kind of you'd feel cheated if that didn't appear at any point. I'm not going to tell you when it appears in this movie. I've seen a lot of others that looked stunning. Terminator 2 comes to mind. This is the first time where I've seen one of these scenes and it legitimately felt like I was right there. Like the Terminator 2 one. To be clear, it feels like the people I'm seeing on screen are right there and it's impressive to me but it doesn't feel like I'm right there and I don't think that's not like uh, that's not a dig on James Cameron one of my favorite directors but the, you know in part the the technology wasn't quite there and it also wasn't what James Cameron was seeking to do with that it is very much you know this movie Nolan wants us to hate the bomb he wants us to fear the bomb he wants us to appreciate in a way that no one like at the end of the day no one you know very few people survive being close to where an atomic bomb detonates you know we we really only have like we can we can you know there are pictures of of the effects and such but this yeah this was the first time you know that it really did feel like you know right there and and like 
I watch this in a crowded theater, which, like, if you can make that happen, make it happen, because it's definitely the way to watch this. And, like, everyone was, like, you know, and, and there were a bunch of young people, like, I, I was not the youngest person there. I think that's, I'd say there were at least two dozen, twenty-somethings, you know, and, ever, like, no one was, like, making jokes or anything. Everyone was just like, <gasps> you know, just, like, you know, the 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 shock wave you know went out of the the movie screen and and hit us it felt like and right Oppenheimer was mentioned by name in Tenet seemingly indicating Nolan already had a, the idea of what his next film was going to be about and let's see Right, and yeah, apparently Pattinson was offered a chance to be in this film. Nolan claimed he was too busy with other projects. He does seem like a guy who keeps busy. He's he's always working. Uh, let's see, and I think that is about what I have. Um. Right, and apparently Sam Mendes originally optioned the rights to American Prometheus. Uh, he he meant for it to be his follow-up to Jarhead in 2005. His iteration never got off the ground. He moved on to Revolutionary Road 2008. I would be interested, you know, it's not going to happen now, obviously, but, like, you know, I, can, I could imagine he could have done a, a really good job. Overall, I'm glad that it's Nolan. I I don't think like I admire uh, Sam Mendes. You know, Jarhead and Revolutionary Road are excellent, and I'm not gonna claim that I still like I I used to really hold. Um, oh right, and oh god, I can't believe I'm playing. 1917, amazing work. Uh, you know, I I used to hold in high regard, but I do acknowledge that it's. Really, really messed up. Uh, American Beauty. Um, yeah, you know the the. I, I he's not quite Nolan. And that yeah, that's that's it for them. So yeah, uh, this does not feature Michael Caine. Uh, he sort of retired, retiring. This is the first Nolan film since Batman Begins to not feature Kane. And Tenet does feel like a send-off. Uh, I, I saw the other day where someone pointed out, you know, like, the an, another character literally says, uh, you know, uh, says good, goodbye to him in a, in a very, like, yeah, it felt like Nolan himself was saying, you know, I'm, I'm sorry we can't work together anymore, but, you know, you've, you've been great. Now, after Dunkirk was the brief break from it, this returns to Nolan making very long movies, starting with The Dark Knight. And he usually uses the running time well, and I would say he does here. I I really don't agree with those who said that it should be trimmed down. And yeah, it's, it's right around three hours. I think it was maybe like four... Four to six minutes less than... But, but yeah... Extremely close to, to three hours. Um, let's see. Yeah, and and yeah, I it's not quite a thriller, uh, you know. And I was all you know the moment I heard that you know it's it's Oppenheimer, you know, it's not like you you can you can make like there's a there's a version of um, Enigma. I've is it just called Enigma? My, it, yeah, two thousand one Enigma you know, actually is the, oh wow, that one isn't even listed as a, a thriller. There's there's aspects of, of thriller in it, I would definitely say. Um, but but yeah, you know, the, the that's also, you know, allies fighting Nazis. But with that one, you know, it's, it's easier to see how you turn that into a, you know, a, a thriller. But but yeah, it's it's the first Nolan movie that isn't a thriller, and yeah, I I seriously respect that. And let's 
see. Right. Um, I think it was Eric. Can't believe I'm playing on his last name from from New Rock Stars, who said that this might be Nolan's first horror film. I think I c I could justify calling it a psychological horror, maybe, but I wouldn't quite go. I I do understand how he reached that conclusion. The trailers do make it look like yeah. Now Oppenheimer famously quoted the Bhagavad Gita. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Personally, I'm with Sarah Connor. I prefer now we're all sons of bitches. That was probably about the worst swearing you could do back then. So if it happened decades later, it would probably have been too strong language for the Sarah Connor Chronicles to quote. But yeah, it's that's also an, a really awesome. I love the the episode of that show that ends with you know. Now we are all sons of bitches. Just, yeah. And, yeah, uh, the atomic bomb did legitimately change the world forever. We live in a post-nuke development world. It may well have served to prevent war in Europe after World War II. Now, let's see. Um, right, so, yeah, some, some critic quotes. Love seeing Murphy as the star for once in Nolan. Confusing, as usual, for Nolan. I, I wasn't really, I, I guess it is a, maybe a little confusing. It's, it's not Tenet. It's not super confusing, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, he points out the bomb looks and sounds amazing. There's a lot of characters that don't get to do much. Robert Downey Jr. gives the performance of a lifetime, first dramatic heavy lifting performance from him for a while. I think he might be trying to bring back the age of the movie star. You know, it's, it's one of those things where, like... There are some actors still working who were present for the age of the movie star before we reached, you know, we are now in the age of spectacle. You know, people don't go to, to movies to see, you know, Jack Nicholson in Chinatown. They go to see, you know, big special effects and, and stunts and such, you know, and, and yeah. Tom Cruise and Robert Downey Jr. both have managed to straddle both worlds. And, yeah, I, I would say this is the performance here from Robert Downey Jr. He's trying to, to bring it back to performance. He's trying to make it. And I really admire, like, not a spoiler, his, it's revealed from very early on, his character is not an appealing person at all. And, in you know, in part... Robert Downey Jr. trusts the audience to remember that he can also be super charismatic, and he also knows that, like, sometimes, you know, not everybody should, not every role requires you to be appealing, and, yeah, like, it's, you know, you, you might have, you'd be forgiven for forgetting, he can play a complete bastard with like no holding back at all like he can be just the most despicable son of a bitch you've ever seen and yeah he does he does an incredible job like this is he is very much like you know there, there was like some you know once once I'm not taking any personal enjoyment out of the fact that I can't believe I'm blanking on the name um, Doolittle I'm take, I'm not taking any pleasure in the fact that it failed I want Downey Jr. to be able to do the movies that he really wants to but once that failed a number of people were like you know so suddenly there was oh you know maybe maybe he'll reappear in the MCU anyway even you know even though he seemed like he was done with that in my opinion his performance in this movie is basically trying to erase our memories of his performance as Tony Stark and I love his Tony Stark so you you know one could understand if I was against that but honestly like it you know actors there are phases to an actor's career and yeah I, I 
I think it makes a lot of sense for him to to distance himself from that. And yeah, like I'm I'm 100% down. Like I've I've loved, you know, it's you know, it's pretty wild to think, but he was he you know he's been working in movies for decades. You know, he was I've you know in the 90s I saw him in stuff that had been made in the 90s. You know, so. Yeah, it's, you know, there, there was, like, I don't, I'm not sure if it was a terribly long time, but I know there was a time when he was, like, you know, heartthrob, kind of romantic lead material, you know, and with with Tony Stark, he moved past that. There was more than the romantic, you know, yeah, obviously a lot of people are attracted to Tony Stark, but there's more there than that, you know. And now he's he's moving even past that, and yeah, like I I really really hope he's able to keep this up. I I cannot wait to see what he does next. Now let's see. Right, so some other critic quotes. Um, I was trying so hard to comprehend the plot towards the second half. Maybe if I watch this again, I can appreciate it more. I mean, I really I I wasn't confused. Um, I don't know, I, I think this person was either overthinking it, or maybe they just didn't know that much. I mean, th that is, you know, for sure, the movie does kind of, like, you can, you don't need to know very much going in, but you do kind of need to know, you know, you need to have a basic understanding of the different, um, the different forces at play in World War II, you know, they, they, they like, yeah, because, you know, for example, if you don't, you know, you're going to be confused when they stop, you know, for, yeah, some of it, they're talking about the Nazis, and then other times they're talking about the Japanese, and if you don't know, yeah, it's, you're, you're going to be confused about, but, but yeah, um, and the, the McCarthyism that was, you know, completely destroying lives, after, you know, and, and, yeah, like, there's, there's a, there's a reference to Hoover that, you know, if you have no idea who that is, you know, that's also going to be a thing that you might struggle, you know, yeah, you, you need a basic understanding of, you know, what American politics were like before, during, and after World War II. And I can imagine maybe this user reviewer just didn't, and I can understand being frustrated with that. Uh, I, I mean, Nolan movies are not trying to be the easiest thing to, you know, but uh, yeah, some, some people say it's too long, others say it's absolutely not too long. I, I agree. Uh, and it didn't feel like three hours. Like, I honestly, I thought it was going to, you know, I was like, oh, I did not buy a big enough drink for all this. Is this candy really gonna okay we'll we'll try our best and like yeah it uh, if I had to I I didn't really feel like this movie felt longer than two hours I would say and right and the yeah there's a one really great quote from a professional critic, Nolan's most powerful provocation in Oppenheimer lies in his suggestion that the American Prometheus came to not only deliver knowledge through science, but also to expose destructive forces that already existed within the national character. And, yeah, absolutely agreed, and it really is, yeah, <laughs> like, one of Nolan's biggest markets is America, so this could easily be biting the hand that feeds, and but but it's it's important to to note you know there's a these are the movie can help confront things that a lot of Americans have never confronted and and certainly like there are people who could be held legally responsible who haven't been so yeah let's see so so yeah I'm not gonna give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending but the ending fits with what came before. And yeah, I th the the ending is absolutely perfect. It's one of the best, one of one of Nolan's best endings. It's it's uh, yeah. Uh, the movie does not have a post credit scene or anything else. Um, I googled 
Not expecting post credit scene, of course. This is Nolan, after all. But, you know, maybe... The, and, and no, it's said there's absolutely no reason to say after. And, you know, I had a bus to catch to get home from the theater, so I did not stay. And... That brings us... Yeah, so the, the dialogue... You know, it is very typical Nolan. It is this thing of, you know, there's a lot to get across, and he has to use some metaphors to get across some of the more, you know, that's, yeah, some, some of these concepts across to, to the general viewer, and that's also a thing. Like, if you know nothing about how they made the atomic bomb, like, the movie's going to try to to get across all the but there's so much else going on there's so many like the, the thematic material and such you know it it's it would be good if you already knew a lot of it you know i was fortunate enough to to know a lot already uh, you know but yeah cuz cuz it is like there's you know it's not just it's not nitroglycerin it's not just this simple thing like that you know nitroglycerin that's just a chemical and you just gotta be careful with how you handle it, and you know, yeah, that's that's basically it. But there's so much more going on here, and the movie does a good job of showing it, and and sort of, but it's definitely like, yeah, I I would recommend, you know, I've I can imagine skimming the the Wikipedia would probably help a lot. So the the cinematography I already talked some about um yeah the the there's some the the filming and editing of the the you know like the yeah the parts where it is like this thing of yeah how how the you know, like what did what did Oppenheimer think? What did he imagine before making the bomb? Uh, you know, the way that's shot and edited is incredibly effective. And yeah, the editing was handled by Jennifer Lame, who has uh, let's see, yeah, she has seventeen editing credits, sixteen for editorial department. And yeah, some of this is shorts, but yeah, other than Oppenheimer, she edited Black Panther Wakanda Forever, Tenant, and oh, right, and I, yeah, she also edited Marriage Story and Hereditary, which I do hear really great things about. Yeah, um, incredible editing, you know, here and in those others, and... Yeah, the you know the the um, chronological jumping is you know you do gotta pay close attention, but I do really appreciate one of the like different you know yeah I mentioned there's three, one of them is always in black and white, so you can immediately tell when that's the one you're seeing you know which yeah very 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 beneficial to the. You know, it, it actually, it reminded me a little of, like, um, J, no, not JFK, Nixon. Uh, mixed up the two presidential movies that I've seen that, uh, I can't believe I'm playing on his name. This, this is, this will not stand. I'll have it momentarily. Oliver Stone, uh, you know, the, the way that he did Nixon, the movie, you know, also has this, you know, there's there's some very significant event or events, and we're, you know, we're, we're seeing people pick apart the decisions made during that, and it'll go to, you know, like, a specific event, historical, that, yeah, historically significant for the, the titular person, you know. Yeah, the, the... I think this works better 
then Nixon. I, I, you know, I rewatched Nixon. I guess by now it's been like a year, but I felt like there were a, there were too many, you know, Oliver Stone. He gets rambly. He's he's incredibly talented, wildly unsubtle, and he gets very rambly sometimes. Though I do really appreciate, you know, he clearly doesn't agree with Nixon politically, but he's still like, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna kick him while he's down, uh, kind of, you know, I I, I respect that. Uh, but but yeah, um, the the um, I think it worked better uh, here. And right, and this was actually filmed, you know, parts of this were filmed in Los Alamos, where, you know, those parts are also set. Some of it is filmed in Los Angeles, some in New Jersey, and Berkeley, and Santa Clarita, you know, the yeah, a, a good amount of location shooting, and the movie gets a lot out of it. Um, Nolan has always been really good at using locations to to a really great effect, and and does it here. It you know here it's not the the kind of you know he likes to. There's a lot of exotic looking places, in you know. For example, Dark Knight Rises and Tenet, you know, incredibly beautiful places that, you know, you, yeah, the, the, that helps add texture to it. Here it's more authenticity, but it really does, yeah, it really does mean a lot of authenticity. And that... Right, the the sound design, as usual for a Nolan movie, amazing. Um, I don't think I want to give too much away about it. I'll just say there's, yeah, there's some absolutely inspired decisions that like, you know, Nolan can can get away with. But like, if any other, like, if someone, if this was the director's first film. And they were like, we're going to do this with sound design. Like, you'd have to bar the doors to prevent the the studio executives from breaking in and saying, no, you can't do that. People won't be able to handle it. And they're completely wrong. We, like, literally everyone loved it. Everyone in the theater. Like, you, it's not that anyone said anything. But you know how, like, if something happens and a huge crowd loves it, even if you can't hear them, you can, like, sense it if you're in the room with them. Literally, like, not a single person was was unhappy about it. Now, yeah, um, if you're watching this by yourself, and, you know, if no one's gonna get upset from you leaving, yeah, I'd say give it, 30, 35 minutes, if at that point you just don't care, the rest of the movie probably isn't for you either. Now, the best elements, it's a tie between the Nolan touch, the acting, the authenticity, and the the relevancy and how well it just, yeah. Um, right, uh, okay, so this is the part of the video where I try to force myself to say at least one negative thing as, like, the worst aspect, just so I don't only gush about movies. Um, I, I did not love the way that the, the I Am Become Death quote was introduced. I thought that, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm missing something. I, it didn't completely feel like it, it worked in my opinion, but that's, that's the only thing. And, and it really, it's not a big deal in my opinion. Now, uh, yeah, so the, the common complaint I saw others have is the, the length, and, you know, a number of people say it's, it's confusing. Uh, the thing I was most worried about was that it would be overstuffed, considering how many great actors are listening to the cast. You know, it's, 
it's closer to, but I don't think quite reaches that they're wasted. You know, I, I wouldn't quite say that, but you know, for sure, don't don't get your hopes up too much about like, yeah. There's it was it was a historical event where a lot of different people played important roles, and you know, Nolan being Nolan, he tried to fit in as many. You know, it's like. It's the opposite. It's it's a it, he he flipped it and reversed it from that what was that Ben Affleck um, Argo, you know where like you know Argo came out and you had like a bunch of people saying that's not um, okay. Um, the movie kind of makes it sound like the Americans were the only people who helped here. That's not true. Um, here's a, here's a list of people who helped a lot who weren't American and it's like you know yeah it's it's I, I really hope that one day Americans will be able to, to just get past this like they're so, they're so so insecure like everything in the world has to re revolve around them or they get very very confused and yeah, this is a movie that absolutely does like this movie actually calls attention to the fact that like it it honestly it feels like he's trolling just a little bit just a little bit and it doesn't like ruin the movie or anything but like you know character after character is like you don't sound American and it's like I see you and yeah I was looking forward to more Noland and the movie absolutely exceeded my expectations. I'm I'm really really glad I you know when I watched Dunkirk I was like oh I I think and I hope that this is the one misstep like I feel like pretty much every director they they've got that one that they just you know they gotta they gotta get that out of their system and once it's out of their system you know like some directors if you watch one bad movie from them it might be the only bad movie they've made you know it's only you know one can be an accident, two is a pattern. Now, the trailers do give too much away, but also give you a good idea of what the movie is like. And uh, cover and poster do not give too much away, and do give a decent idea of what the movie is like. So, on Rotten Tomatoes, this has a 93%. Um, 296 reviews. 18 rotten. Okay, I kind of I'm I'm just I'm just going to briefly skim but the um wow, one person said that Oh, hold on. Wait. National Review. Aren't they one of those I'm going to I'm going to double check so I'm not I feel like I heard that the National Review are a conservative. That's why he's saying, "Oh, you know, this is perversely amoral." I'm going to I'm going to just direct you to Cavernacle if you disagree with the following statement. Conservatives are terrible at media literacy. They they don't understand movies. This is not even remotely amoral. But yeah, it's it's cuz it he doesn't think that it criticizes communism enough. I'm I'm almost certain that's what it is. I I honestly like if you take if you watch this movie and what you take away is that, you know, communists were pretty right. Like dude, look look closer. That's not what the movie is saying. Um let's see. Yeah, so the let's Yeah, some some say that um Oppenheimer doesn't feel human no one no one's hands. Um one says that it's too long. Um And the 
Yeah, one says it feels like a three-hour Wikipedia entry. And... One person says there are virtually three different complete movies lurking within this or long piece. I really don't agree that they're different, but yeah. Um, let's see, and the yeah, one person thinks that the gravitas of the film is cartoonish. One says it's too talky. Um, wow. Um, one says it bounces around too much, and uh, one says the, the the bleeding soundscape is one of no one's favorite indulgences. The movie gives into or that he gives into making the movie and then yeah another says you know the excesses of the narrative um, let's see the movie is a work in constant conflict with itself and yeah one says style or substance anyway um and the yeah audience with more than 500 verified ratings it has a 94 percent audience score 4.6 out of 5 is the average rating and the average critic ratings 8.70 out of 10 the consensus Oppenheimer marks another engrossing achievement from Christopher Nolan that benefits from Murphy's tour de force performance and stunning visuals and that brings us to Metacritic, where it has an 89, right, and yeah, so it's certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. On Metacritic, it has an 89 must-see badge from 89 out of 100 from critics, and yeah, uh, 62 reviews, 61 of them positive, one mixed. Let's see, the mixed one... Um, yeah, the, the, also does not think that the time hopping worked. And then, yes, the, the user score is 9.3 out of 10. Universal acclaim based on 148 ratings, 142 positive, one mixed and five negative. And... Yeah, uh, one one of the negatives. Yeah, I take issue with one of the things they say. I'm going to talk about it in the spoiler section. But um, but yeah, to to give you an idea of you know, okay, so this person gave it a zero and wrote a review. Three people upvoted th upvoted that. Twenty two downvoted it. So that's that's what happens when when someone has that negative of a yeah, and it's just like overrated and boring, waste of three hours of my life. Like I feel like should should there maybe just be like if all you write all you can think of to write is overrated, boring, wasted time, maybe like as soon as you type it in, the website should just eat it and just write can you be more original? Can you explain what that even means? Like, overrated is a completely subjective opinion. Like, what, what is rated to this guy? What's underrated to this guy? You know, if you're not going to give any examples, it's a useless word in, in the review. And boring, that is extremely subjective. I, I realize reviews are all subjective, but just... Instead of saying boring, just say what you wanted versus what it has. You know, the fact that this guy says it's boring, like, I, I can't even imagine thinking this movie is boring. Anyway, um, 
One thing he does, this, this reviewer does say, that they say, it's a soulless movie. I disagree, but that's at least a criticism. That's something, you know, yeah. And, yeah, one says, not a lot seems to be happening. There's a lot of noise and shaky cam at points they want you to think are intense. And, for sure, like, it is the kind of thing where, like, yeah, not a lot happens. It is mostly the, the you know, what is what is this going to lead to kind of thing, the, the moral questions of it. And... Yeah, one, one person who admits to f almost falling asleep, and, you know, I do respect, this person at least says, if you're looking for an entertaining movie, watch Mission Impossible instead. That, and, and I do, Mission Impossible is also excellent. But, yeah, and, and this guy actually does give an example, you know, before using the word boring, this reviewer writes, pretty much, pretty much just talking about science the whole time. He's wrong, but that's at least an argument, you know. There's a lot, there's a lot of talking about other stuff, including politics and the changing world. Now... Yeah, and and one. Yeah, I'm I'm not gonna go over everything this person says, but there is a you know Metacritic users review section does have a review from someone who gave it a five out of ten, and yeah, like they actually gave uh, you know yeah, there's there's actually stuff that, you know, yeah, they're making arguments. I, I don't really agree with them, but, you know, it's it's there. You can, you can look it up. I'm not going to go over all of it. Now, on IMDB, it has... I'm just going to click the thing to get the most up-to-date number because it may have changed since before I watched yes it the rating is 9.0 out of 10 based on 43,000 votes 58.8 percent of which are 10 out of 10 which makes a lot of sense 21.0 uh, percent there are 9 10.9 percent there are 8 4.4 percent there are 7 1.8% that are that are one. I would be shocked if not a chunk of the one percenters there were people who either thought it didn't go hard enough on communism and people who there's a there's there's an element in the movie that I'm sure a lot of conservatives don't think was judged harshly enough in the film. 1.6% uh, gave it 6, 0 0.6 gave it 5, 0 0.4 gave it 4, 0 0.2 gave it 3, 0 0.3 gave it 2. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, it might change, it's still, you know, it, it, it premiered very, very recently. But it is entirely possible that, but, but yeah, for now, very, very, positively received. There are 527 IMDb user reviews, and if you hide spoilers, there are 439 of them. Now, I... Let's see... Yeah, and I... I, I, I read uh, some of them. I didn't get to read quite as many as I'd hoped. Now, the, the 100 that were voted in as most useful by people who didn't write the review. One person gave it a 1 out of 10, one gave it a 2 out of 10, two gave it 3, two gave it 4, one gave it 5, two gave it 6, four gave it 7, 11 gave it 8, 13 gave it 9, and 73 of 100 gave it 10. This is, this is a positively received movie, is, is what I'm trying to say here. And let's see. 
Oh, wow. Yeah, it actually, it's, it's, it's on the IMDb top 250 because it has, in you know, it has enough votes that, holy crap, it beat Apocalypse Now. Um, okay. Agree to disagree. I do not think this is quite... <laughs> but, you know, that's... That might... Uh, yeah. You know, it's fine. We don't have to agree on everything. But yeah. Above it are still Alien Rear Window, Once Upon a Time in the West. Let's see... Grave of the Fireflies. Casablanca, Usual Suspects, The Prestige. The Departed... American History X, Gladiator, The Lion King, 2019, I'm kidding, 1994, obviously, Leon the Professional, Parasite, Psycho, The Pianist, Spirited Away, Back to the Future 1, Terminator 2, New Hope, Green Mile, Life is Beautiful, City of God, Interstellar, Saving Private Ryan, The Silence of the Lambs, Seven Samurai, Seven, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Goodfellas, The Matrix, Empire Strikes Back, Inception, Across the Spider-Verse, The Two Towers, Fight Club. Ah, oh, crap, I just... And now I'm out of Fight Club. Thanks a lot, IMDb. The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, Fellowship of the Ring, Pulp Fiction, Return of the King, Schindler's List, Twelve Angry Men, Godfather Part Two, The Dark Knight, still top rated of the, of the Nolan films, and it's really no wonder. The Godfather and the Shawshank Redemption. So yeah, um, it's it's in good company up there, and yeah, I completely understand how people. Uh, so so yeah, um, the special effects are amazing. Uh, so so you know, I already mentioned none of it's CGI. Um, so they they came up with ways to make it. To bring it to life without, yeah, that's, I I seriously respect Nolan for, for even making that decision. And it's like, you know, he's been doing that for as long as he's been able to, yeah, basically since the start. Like, in his mind, CG is like those last little bit that you can't, but you have to build everything up to that, you know, practically. And, yeah, um... Yeah, the stuff there is is very, very convincing. Like, I look forward to finding out how the heck they made that nuclear explosion look so freaking real without any CG. Um, there's some really great stunt work. And... Yeah, so um, I'm not going to get into the the sexual material too much here. I just want to say I've seen some people say that they really didn't like that aspect. I mean, it's not... I don't think it's supposed to be appealing. It's it's basically... I'm going to talk... I, I can't really talk about it without spoiling. I'll, I'll talk about it in the second spoiler section. But I just want to say, please don't don't skip this movie because some idiot online wrote that they didn't like the the nudity in the movie. Just, you know what? If you need to, close your eyes like you're five when the nudity. It, it's easy to avoid, trust me. If, if, that's, if that's the thing that's otherwise just going to completely keep you from watching this movie, just, you know, yeah. Um... But the yeah, for the don't don't rob yourself of this movie, and certainly don't rob. I I've seen I saw a review that said that you shouldn't watch this in a movie theater. I mean, I don't I don't even know why. Like, no, just no. He's, he's wrong. Dude's wrong. Chick's wrong. Whatever. Whoever, you know. I don't I don't. I'm not gonna presume their gender identity. They're wrong. And, yeah, if, if at all this movie sounds appealing, watch it and watch it in a theater, and if at all possible, watch it in a crowded theater. Now, um, yeah, um, 
10 out of 10. I, I, it's, it, yeah, I, I, you might have already guessed that, that I was going there. Um, yeah, this is one of those movies where I think in the future, this might be even more popular than it already is right now as, as people look back on it and realize what it was trying to say. And, uh, yeah, so, so a quick, um, yeah, ranked all films directed by Christopher Nolan, worst to best, following is the only I haven't watched. Dunkirk is the only I don't love. Dunkirk, Insomnia, Memento, Batman Begins, The Dark Knight Rises, Interstellar, The Dark Knight, Inception, The Prestige, Tenet, and Oppenheimer. It is my new favorite. I, I really did not think that that would happen so soon. You know, like, when I watched Tenet, I also knew, okay, this is like, this is amazing. This I, I don't even know how you're going to be able to top this kind of thing, you know. And, yeah, you know, other than that, you have to go all the way back to the prestige, you know, 2006, to reach what I consider the the best he'd uh, he'd gotten, and just yeah, yeah. I guess that's that's one way to to beat the prestige for me is to to use that same ingenious chronological jumping, yeah, uh, yeah. So for for the rest of the video, there will be spoilers and. Yeah, so so please don't rob yourself of the experience. Don't watch any further unless you've already watched the movie. Starting with notes taken while watching, I actually I managed to to fill out almost the entire. I think there's like six pages that I didn't write on. So yeah, so we actually yeah we open on the 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 raindrops. And the, the, let's see, the, yeah, and then we see the, the nuke, um, I think it's the, the, hmm, I did not write this very clearly, um, yeah, some, some kind of nuke footage, and at the, at the very end, we go back to the, the, you know, that exact occasion, and we realize that he's standing there thinking about, you know, Maybe the world really was destroyed, you know, not the way that we had anticipated by the the chain reaction, but you know, morally destroyed. And yeah, we we get the the Prometheus quote as an opening, which you know, yeah, you, you kind of gotta go there since the rest, so much of the rest of the movie is about his Prometheus status. And let's see. Yeah, and, and we go to um Yeah, yeah, five years after the Right, and, and we get yeah, the first of of several times where we see Oppenheimer completely lost in thought and someone else basically has to snap him out of it. And yeah, so now Strauss is on or Strauss, sorry, that was how he you know really really not yeah, can't can't stand the real Louis Strauss, but I'm not going to you know, if that was how he felt comfortable about his his name yeah. But but yeah, you know, it's that thing the the you know Strauss was you know, he didn't put Oppenheimer on trial and now he's not on trial. I quite appreciate you know, and that's where it is very much the the you know, I'm not I'm not gonna spoil. Um prestige but you know that one is also about two people who you know they have certain goals and those goals might involve each other involve the other person and as such you know it'll it'll cut between the the different people 
you know, even as it shows events that, you know, where both of them were present. And, yeah, I, it's, it's, it, sh it shouldn't work as well as it does. It seems like such a, you know, it's, it's like, like a film student idea, like, you know, oh, it's, uh, you know, yeah, uh, one of the first things is Oppenheimer explaining his life story to face the, the accusations you know, that, that we later learn it was Strauss who wanted the, the uh, you know, because he wanted, yeah, he wanted Oppenheimer to lose his security clearance, you know, and yeah, like he, you know, Oppenheimer says, you know, I'm, I, I'm willing to, to face down these, these accusations, but I have to explain, you know, and, the, and they're like, dude, we didn't ask for your life story, you know, yeah, his, his life story is required it's, you know, it, it will be on the test. You know, he doesn't make the rules. In order to, to explain why things happened the way they did. And I feel like the, over the course of the movie, yeah, you understand. Like, because, yeah, like, if you just look at on paper, you know, oh, wow. Uh, while the Soviet Union was an enemy of America and they wanted the nuke, you socialized with how many openly communist Americans? You know, it's it's like okay, I'm gonna break it down for you. Just you know, it's actually a very funny story, but but yeah, it it absolutely works. It's it's ridiculous how well it's just yeah, and um, yeah, we we learned that you know. There's this Niels Bohr, uh, I can do better than that, Niels Bohr lecture that they, you know, Oppenheimer really wants to go to, and the teacher's like, nope, you're gonna, you're gonna stay here and clean up after the rest of us. And he puts cyanide in an apple, which, like, I didn't, I'm not sure I knew people actually did that. Like, there's a... Um, there's this Danish, uh, um, book and later film, ah, uh, crap, what, um, let's see, what, uh, does it not say at all? Okay, I'm, I'm having a little trouble finding the, 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 uh, the the English translation of the um, hmm. oh right that uh, um, I know how to find it but yeah there's there's a um, it's not the first time yes it's called stolen spring a a Danish movie from 1993 it's not our best but it's pretty good. That one also has, you know, yeah, it's, um, I guess, oh yeah, wait, wait, did I hear that apparently for that book, they got the idea from Oppenheimer, or am I thinking of something? Anyway, but, but yeah, that was, I, I did not expect to be reminded of, uh, Danish movie from 1993 which is based on a book and yeah you know we see him in in the college and you know he's he's trying to get his hand on the apple so that you know it won't you know suddenly he wakes up <gasps> I'm a killer <laughs> not not good you know and yeah and and he's told to go to to born and but not Jason Bourne him he only meets later and you know it's it's the kind of thing like it's it's you know played for laughs it's kind of funny that he he does the, you know but yeah you know he 
f out of out of spite and and you know it's this thing like has he even gotten any sleep and this kind of thing he almost gives the the teacher this uh, you know poison apple <laughs> i guess while trying to fall asleep he was reading a lot of fairy tales i don't know um but you know he feels really bad and he makes sure nobody takes a bite out of it by throwing it in the trash you know so the yeah and later on he you know he's responsible for you know yeah in the in the not trial trial they say you know 220,000 deaths and Yeah, we, we get the detail that Strauss and Oppenheimer are both Jewish, and Oppenheimer believes that Strauss is hiding it with the pronunciation. Let's see. And... Yeah, we, we get the detail that, you know, Oppenheimer and Einstein knew each other for years before it and we see that the the you know Einstein won't even look at Strauss and I I really appreciate near the end of the movie where that gets completely turned to to you know we realize what was really going on there and yeah the the not a trial trial people you know ask did Oppenheimer did you meet Russian physicists which is of course and I I appreciate you know there's the the lecture and before Oppenheimer opens his mouth you know we think it's gonna be kind of a a mess but no he's fluent in Dutch and he meets I have to admit I I did not expect to see Ah, uh, hold on, I'll have it, I'll have the name momentarily. Um, David Krumholtz, did not expect to see him, especially in a dramatic role. Um, I mean, I, I really, really, <laughs> I loved his role in the, um, hold on. Wow, he's been a lot. Um, Adam's family values, you know, that was, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, he is in 10 Things I Hate About You. I remember him as being good in, in that, but it has been a long time. Um, yeah, not really a fan of You Stupid Man, but that's not his fault. It's not even... Like it's it's there's some really really talented people in that it's you know it's the screenplay and the directing that's why it's bad um, right and he's in he's in that other um, um, scorched it's called but but yeah um, anyway I, I really appreciate the detail about you know Isidore keeps giving him food to to make sure he he eats enough, and it is this thing you know I I I will admit like years ago I I didn't know but apparently you know and some Jewish people at least not not Travol but some of them even if it's not like family but just like friend you know they'll 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 bring them food they'll make sure that they they get food and yeah it's just it's a it's a really lovely aspect of of the the culture that they're you know they are they yeah it's it's very very selfless you know like he he literally just met this guy and like Oppenheimer as usual like throughout the film he's really not making a great first impression like you know he like he basically implies the you know he there's the thing about you know you learned Dutch in six weeks but you don't speak Yiddish it's like oh not my side of the park wow 
and yeah, and and we have you know he meets Heisenberg, the one who knocks, and they and yes, I am aware that in that show Heisenberg is a reference. To, I'm, I'm, yeah. Anyway, uh, but yeah, you know they meet and they crossed paths later. And yeah, the you know he's he's gonna give a lesson to just one student, and I I quite like the thing with you know the the um, do you understand uh, was it quantum physics or physics is it something like that, you know and and the students like mm, yeah I th I think I understood it okay then you you're doing it wrong you know <laughs> just. Why can't all teachers be that fun? Uh, you know, and it, it cuts a couple of times and we see the the drastically increasing amount of students. And it's no wonder. He's clearly a, a very engaging teacher. And yeah, we get the detail about, you know, why was there even a file on Oppenheimer before the, the war stuff? And, you know, Strauss is like, you'd have to ask Hoover. Because he was left wing, you know, and it's yeah, like I I I think I'd even forgotten. Like I heard years and years ago that Hoover had a file on, but but yeah, the moment that it got mentioned that oh yeah, you know, because he was left wing, yeah, Hoover, ridiculously paranoid, like just almost as paranoid as Republicans today are. And yeah, they talk about integration and yeah, Oppenheimer talks politics with communists and agrees on some of it and you know discusses politics with with Gene and I like the detail that you know is like oh you know I, I read I read all three you know v v volumes I forget you know and, and she's like, oh that's more than most people you know most of the communists here you know, which is like, yeah, even back then, that was apparently a thing. Like, people would call themselves communists and not have actually read Das Kapital, you know, and the, the, yeah, and, and like the reason that, you know, she, she's like, well, how, how do you not know? No, you're, you're quoting it wrong. And, and he's like, well, no, I mean, I read it in the original German, you know, and it's this thing of like, okay, so, yeah. <laughs> Either she's gonna be really, really like that's that's either gonna like she's either gonna be really, really pissed off and and think you're so conceited, you're unbearable, or she's gonna be like, wow, that's actually you know I hadn't even you know I can't read it in the original you know not not saying she's not like educated or something, but just yeah you you can understand why there's a um yeah I can't find the There's the, um, I don't know why this got six downloads, that's, anyway, there's a, in the IMDb quote section, you know, there's a, um, when they, when they do stage direction, they put them in the, in the brackets, you know, and, uh, yeah. Heisenberg is a character in this movie, and one of the quotes puts in brackets, you know, Heisenberg is the danger. I approve. That's that's good. I like that. Um, right, and and yeah, there's the great line when when you know Oppenheimer meets Klaus Fuchs. Since when are you British? Since Hitler told me I wasn't German. You know, it's it's really too bad that he turns out to be a, a Soviet spy. But that is a, a great point. You know, yeah, of course, you know, and that is literally, like, you know, he said they are not, they, they don't belong here, uh, Hitler said of the Jews. Now, right, and, and the, you know, we get the line, of, you know, they're talking about, you know, little little wiggle room, and then it cuts, and she's on top. 
and yeah, I don't, I don't know if I love that, you know, so they were having sex, and then she gets the, the Bhagavad Gita, and holds it up in front of him and says, no, no, don't explain, just read the words. And he reads, you know, now I am become death, destroyer of worlds, and they have sex. And it's like, I mean, they were just talking about the, what's the word? Uh, they were just talking about Fr Freud and such. And, I mean, Freud did have a theory about, like, you know, we have a we have a sex drive, but we also have a, a drive towards death. So maybe that's what it's. I, I don't know. I I don't know. Maybe I'll I'll come around on it. But I that might not have been my favorite part of the movie. Let's go with that. And right, and he says, you know, if I could combine physics and New Mexico, that would be you know amazing. And. Yeah, it's all about figuring out how to split the atom. And yeah, they point out, you know, academics should get a union. And yeah, and, and Oppenheimer and Kitty talk about quantum physics, and Emily bluntly states some facts to Oppenheimer and you know, I do, I do appreciate that she gets to be a a strong woman. You know, I I'm still not sure that I love the way Nolan writes female characters, but I mean it's better than the the crap that used to be. You know, typical female character. You know, I I prefer this kind of. You know, just it's just, just a little bland. There's not a lot there. You know, I I. It's, you know, it's not like no, there are men who can write women in a more, you know, empathetic way that, but, but yeah, again, it's certainly better. And at least, you know, she doesn't even die to motivate his pain. So, I mean, that's a step up. That's, that's a, yeah. Now, yeah, and, and the thing with, you know, Oppenheimer and some of the students want a union, and now, you know, um, I'm blanking on the character name and the actor name, the, um, I swear it was right here, uh, uh, Hartnett, Ernest Lawrence, that's it you know, can't tell Oppenheimer about the nuke, and, yeah, you know, the, um, Oppenheimer leaves the Communist Party to become part of the Dr. Manhattan Project. Let's see, and then we have you know, I mean, that is the thing. Like, people say the sex scenes in this were awkward. The sex scenes are also awkward in, in the Watchmen adaptation. Maybe you can't have a Dr. Manhattan character without awkward sex scenes. I don't know. And, uh, yeah, you know, um, Kitty struggles with baby Peter, and baby Peter gets dumped on the... Um, yeah. Let's see. Um, the the other. Yeah. And yeah, Oppenheimer meets Matt Damon and Dane DeHaan. I really really enjoyed the line about you know, oh wow you treat your lieutenant like that how do you treat a humble humble physicist. I'll tell you when I meet one. Burn. <laughs> if there's another epic rap battle, I think the Matt Damon character should be writing some of these bars. Damn. And yeah, we get a montage of the recruitment. And, you know, Robbie points out 
you know, they'd be making a WMD, and it's going to hit the just and unjust alike. And... Yeah, they talk about the, the chance of a chain reaction that would destroy the entire world. And... Yeah, I... Um, I think the, the uh, Chevalier was the character name. Tells Oppenheimer, you know, there's a way to get information about the nuke to the Soviets. Just thought you'd like to know. Just putting it out there, you know. And and that was legitimately like the I, I you know I was watching it and and the like there was an audible gasp like. Is he seriously? Did, did he just try to? And, and you know, Oppenheimer points out that would be treason. Just yeah. And yeah, the yeah, we get, we see the Strauss thing that you know, if Einstein talks, that could you know, he might not get the position. And they talk about hydrogen. I really appreciate when they talk about the different ideas for how to make the bomb work. And, yeah, really, like, you know, I'm not going to lie. Like, when I was a teenager, you know, I didn't think about the complexities of a nuke. It was just like, you know, when I'm playing an RTS, it's like it's one of the most effective ways to, to win. You know, you'll want to you want to get the nuke, and then you click a button, and you target the area, and that's it. You know, but it is it is a very complex thing in reality. And yeah, then we have the. Um, yeah, we were, you know, Oppenheimer realizes that it is. I'm, I'm just kidding, you're seeing acronyms for some of these. It's Matt Damon who's been withholding the security clearance. And, yeah, they're trying to determine who leaked to the Soviets. And I, like. <laughs> I didn't remember, but I, I had heard the, the answer before watching the movie, and I was still, like, it's still tense to see them trying to figure out. And Chevalier gets mentioned again before. It's not quite yet the big, you know, reveal that... But, but yeah. Um, and... Right, and we learned that Lomanitz was drafted because he tried to start a union. You know, and, and this is where I think some conservatives are like, you know, why isn't the movie more clearly against communism? I mean, I feel like the movie makes it clear, for one thing, Soviet Union, just plain bad. Like, the movie never makes anything about the Soviet Union seem appealing. Um, so then, you know, then you have the issue of there are several characters who are communist, and some of them we are meant to at least feel some sympathy for. I really don't... Like, it's not saying that it's good for, like... I, I really feel like it's just like saying, you know, there were a number of groups of people, you know, they talk about racial integration, they talk about anti-Semitism, and they talk about communists. And, yeah, like, obviously, the, the you know, yeah, the Soviet Union, bad. You know, the fact that Putin is trying to conquer, to make a new Soviet Union, also bad. And the... I, I really don't feel like the movie 
makes it feel like like I it felt like every time we know every time we meet someone and learn that they're a a um, communist or socialist you know immediately like there's a there's a weight to that you know I I I don't think that the movie makes it feel like communists were like I mean I don't even know what I, the, the thing is there are, there are Republicans today who don't think that McCarthyism was bad so the fact that you know for sure there's a lot of conservatives who watch this and like had a conniption fit when Strauss s referred to McCarthy as a clown you know I found it quite funny and I, I forget he said something other than clown and it was just it it's exactly the right way to like if you think that McCarthyism like if you think that McCarthy had some good ideas then instead of hating people who point out how terrible he was hate him for being terrible like the the you know there are people that I where I'm like, ah, oh, I really agree with that idea, but then they go and, you know, until recently I had a lot of respect for Young Turks. Now I find them, you know, I, I, I wish that they had never, you know, but, but yeah, now they're, they're repeating transphobic talking points from conservatives. You know, the, the, I'm afraid I forget, I believe they were called, the, they're, I'm I'm forgetting both the both their name and their their gender identity. I'm uh, let's see. Uh, um. Uh, let's see. Hmm. Uh, uh, Benny Carollo um, and um, let's see the, okay for some reason I cannot find but but yeah um, yeah you know Benny Benny Carollo left TYT because of how transphobic they are, and and they still won't admit that they're being transphobic when that's a pretty clear sign. Like Benny was completely on board with. Anyway, um, you know, it was only because of of transphobia that Benny left. Anyway, um, trying to not misgender Benny. Um, yes, so the. <clears throat> you know, I'm not mad at Benny for pointing out that TYT is now being transphobic. I'm not mad at trans people for feeling let down by them. I, uh, you know, I don't know, everybody agrees, but I think it's the right thing to leave behind TYT. The, the you know, I, I used to believe that Cenk, uh, Cenk um, genuinely believed in progressive causes, but I'm starting to lose faith in that. So the only other thing that, you know, I can point to and say this is something that matters, you know, is it's num numbers. You know, he's he used to brag, I, maybe he still does, it's been a while since I watched but he used to brag about being, you know, Young Turks being the biggest progressive, you know, show. If a lot of us progressives leave, that, you know, impacts the numbers. That's a way to to make our voices heard, you know, and and yeah, I I think I have.
made my point. So so yeah, um, I like the the running thing of like Jean says she doesn't want flowers, so she dumps you know, and and you know he comes to her, brings flowers, and she dumps them again. There's that got a laugh out of a, a chunk of the of the audience watching the movie. And yeah, and we have them sitting across from each other, nude in chairs. And yeah, then then we get the bit where like, you know, at first I wasn't entirely sure what they were getting at when it cuts back to to the interrogation thing, and now Oppenheimer is at least, you know, bare chested in the in the room, but then we see you know Jean riding him in the you know during this examination. And she makes eye contact with Kitty, and yeah. So I, this is the part where some people are saying, "Oh, you know, it's like, it's, it's an awkward sex scene." It is supposed to be. It's not supposed to be. Like I, I really, I hope at some point in the future we reach a point where people can look at a sex scene and not just discard it with the words, it's awkward. It's supposed to be, like, this is, for crying out loud, this exact thing happened, let's see, 11 years ago with Black Swan. People were like, I mean, the sex scenes are that are so awkward. Yeah, because they're supposed to be. Like, if you look at the context, like, just, it's so frustrating that, like, I, look, I get it. On some level, I get it. Sex scenes used to be masturbation aids. That's literally it. Like, it, there's a lot of 80s and 90s movies where sex isn't telling a story. It's not developing characters. It's not doing anything. It's just there to get people to watch it on Skinamax, to rent it on home video, you know, to, to recommend it to, to other people to do that. <clears throat> and so a lot of people haven't caught up to the fact that, no, that's not, like, sometimes there are still, you know, there are shows and movies that still just feature them, just, you know, yeah. But, you know, Marvel, Netflix, uh, Black Swan, and this, they're using it for something, and... I'm not going to go over the other ones, but for this movie in particular, the reason that suddenly in this room full of people, you know, Gene is, is riding Oppenheimer, the reason is everyone in the room knows that it happened. So it's basically like, it's, a, it's visualizing what everyone in their nose happen. Like, if you look at the way the characters react, like, other than Kitty, clearly it's not actually happening. You know, and it's, it's, like, it's not supposed to be erotic. Like, it's not as though Nolan is incapable of filming a conventionally attractive woman in a way that underlines that she is conventionally attractive like you know yeah the the <clears throat> one of the biggest examples would be some of the framing for catwoman in the dark knight rises you know and there is also some in uh hold on i'm going to tip up my tongue some in the prestige and some in tenet you know but this movie clearly it's not supposed to be appealing and like i said in the review like if that part bothers you so much just close your eyes it's not you know it's not that long it's not big part or or anything Let's see. and you know i i know not everybody came for that you know, some some people might have wished they hadn't come at all. 
it's just I, I I think we we have to let artists do their thing you know it's it's just gonna be so dry if if you know yeah I'm out of and I'm, I'm out of double entendres and I'm not a big fan of the single ones let's just say they're single for a reason but yeah then we we meet um, the the um, hold on I'll have it momentarily uh, oh that's right yeah we meet Boris Pash and Casey Affleck you know, we, we hear some some things about him and like this this dude's a real son of a bitch. And so was Boris Pash, apparently. And yeah, you know, Pash killed communists with his own two bare hands. That's B A R he hands. Let's see. And um Yeah, we, we learned that Gene died, and it's this thing of, I mean, she didn't sign the suicide note. You know, was she, was she murdered, or did she suicide? And, yeah. I gotta say, the, the, the bit about, you know, um... I've, I'm afraid I forget the, the character's name, but, you know, a, a woman walks in to, you know, and they're like, I, I'm just saying we don't know the full impact it, you know, all this radiation can have on a woman's reproductive organs, and she fires back with the masterful, your, your reproductive organs are a lot more exposed than mine. Which tells me that she's aware of what's going on between Jean and, and just, uh, no, that was that was great. And yeah, and and uh, Oppenheimer expresses, you know, he really did think that the atom bomb would lead to peace. He thought that it would mean that it wouldn't be used. And we see the explosion, and I really love the detail, because it's true. Light travels faster than sound. So you'd see the explosion, that would be the light, much sooner than you would hear it. You know, and the and and when the the sound of the explosion does actually come, you know, it like it shocks the audience. Like everyone like jumped in their seat when that happened, you know. It's a really, really great way to, to do that. And, yeah, they talk about, you know, making a weapon against the Nazis or the Russians. And, yeah, talk about, you know, two nukes, you know, to hit J Japan. You know, 12 cities, up, uh, 11 there's this one place, it's very culturally significant, and we went there, so beautiful, just, do you hear yourself? You know, and, and this is, like, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name, I'll, I'll have it momentarily, um, Okay, I know how to. It'll definitely be in here. Yeah, you know this. It's James Remar. Like, dude, really went. His his quality of conscience really went downhill after he stopped being Dexter's. And yeah, they talk about the near zero odds. And we have the, the countdown to detonation and, yeah, the amazing Trinity test, the, the look and the sound design. 
And we again have the I'm become death. <coughs> And, yeah, you know, now that, yeah, Oppenheimer has lost control of the nuke, uh, you know, now that he has proven it can work, they don't want his, you know, he, he makes the, you know, he says, oh, uh, you know, you, you'll want to make sure that it doesn't get dropped from a too high, you know, plane, it could, you know, and they're like, we'll take it from here. Right, and the, the thing with, you know, near zero and zero odds I like how that showed the 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 distinction between military man Matt Damon and scientist Oppenheimer because of course the military man would say well we have we have our target right here we have to be as precise precise as possible to, to best ensure the successful military operation and then you have Oppenheimer, the scientist, who's like, well, it, well, it can't be zero. Like, you know, and that's, you know, I remember that was one of the first things we, you know, I haven't taken science on that high of a level, but like the, the college-ish level, you know, uh, biology, you know, one of, the, one of the very first things that the teacher told us was that in science, there's no such thing as absolute certainty there's always some chance or some variation or some kind of you know it's it's there's no such thing as 100 percent and yeah you know so so it's it's basically it's the collision of these two wait that's not collision collision of these two different ways of of you know looking at this kind of thing and you know i don't blame the matt damon character you know Near zero is not as good as absolute zero risk that the world will end. And 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 I like the the setup because like at the time you just think you know oh well, well Matt Damon you did ask for Oppenheimer you did ask, you know you said that you guys need a nuke you, you know what what are you gonna do but then at the very end you know it's the thing remember how we said it, there was a chance it would destroy the world. I think it did. And yeah, you know, they, they don't tell Oppenheimer about the nuke. He has to hear via radio. And yeah, you know, his world is shaking and there's screams of fear and pain, not celebration, which I, I really appreciate because, like, visually, it looks like what we're getting is like celebration, but. And at least some of the time, some of the time it does also look, you know, yeah. And we get the white flash and the skin starts to peel off just, yeah. And then suddenly he's, he's alone. And I really appreciate he didn't disappear. Because that would have been, like, you could understand, you know, because that, that would also send a message, but it would send a different one. If he disappeared, that would mean everyone is dead. But he's, he's left which means everyone else is dead. He killed everyone. And that's that's the guilt that he feels, you know, not literally that he thinks he killed everyone, but the, you know, yeah, he he killed so many people. And the the great shock when the sound suddenly returns, and I really appreciate like also that that might also have been something that the conservatives were not happy about with this movie when he says, you know, he's, he's giving this big speech, and he's like, oh, you know, just wish we could have used it on the Germans, you know, and, cut, and, and we get some shots, and they're like, yeah, you know, just absolutely, like, a complete fervor. Like, they're not stopping to, think, like, but the, but the Nazis aren't in the war anymore. Like, why do you need, you know, why, why do you, why are you running this thought experiment of, oof, I just wish we could have nuked some Nazis. It's just, you know, but that's the, it's it's this mindless, patriotic, rah-rah, you know, victory at all costs. You know, it doesn't, if you stop to think about it, like, it's, yeah. And, and the, yeah, 
you know, he looks at the, the Time magazine cover where he's listed as Father of the Atom Bomb. And great scene between Truman and Oppenheimer. And Truman is basically convinced that the Russians can't make a nuke. And, you know, he doesn't, like, there's no sense that, you know, it's like, what? What do you mean? What do you mean? Why? Like, Oppenheimer isn't just blowing smoke out his ass. He's, you know, like throughout the movie, Oppenheimer doesn't really say things that he, like, he he'll sometimes lie, but he doesn't like give. When he gives his opinion, it's usually based on, you know, and and you know, he said, "I I feel like I have blood on my hands," and Truman pulls out the handkerchief and then just, yeah. And, you know, and, and yeah, when he leaves, you know, he overhears Truman say, don't let that crybaby in here again. Just, I really appreciate it. Like, it's, it's been a minute since I saw Gary Oldman play such a despicable character. He, he used to play them all the time. He's still really good at it. That was, uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate seeing that again. And, and yeah, um, let's see. Um, yeah, uh, Oppenheimer tried to influence politics using the, the fact that people thought, you know, he was considered a hero. And we learn Fuchs was a spy, the Soviets, and Oppenheimer sees all these pictures from the aftermath of the nuke, the, the horrors. And I appreciate that the movie didn't feel the need to show them to us. And it is, like, um, it's been a while since I looked at them myself, but I believe they are still, like, if you want to, uh, I, I think they are available to, to find and, and look at. And it's the, because, for one thing, the important thing is what it does to Oppenheimer. This is his movie, you know, and we see his face. We see, clearly, it's, it's very upsetting to him that this was the thing, you know, he he didn't become a physicist to kill people you know if he if he just wanted to kill people he could have just like joined the army or you know uh, run for conservative you know yeah become a republican politician or something he wanted to help people and you know he became so scared of the yeah the the idea that the the Nazis would get it before the Americans did, and and yeah, we learn that Strauss used Borden, and yeah, there's this repeated line where you know, maybe especially Kitty, but other characters as well ask Oppenheimer, why aren't you fighting this harder? And you know, it it. Basically, like, he's scared of what will happen. Like, he did this. You know, this didn't happen despite of him. He did this. He was the leader of the the project out there. You know, this is... The, these deaths are on him. So, he has to be extremely careful with what he does. You know, he never... He did not mean for this to happen. He thought it would be a, a, a deterrent. And yeah, we get the thing about you know, oh, is the the um yeah, I, I forget the character name, but you know, is that particular guy? Is he still your friend? And he says yes, and you can tell you you know you see the the lawyer guy there, and he's like, oh my god, and. Yeah, they read the the letter by Borden. Really, really loving scene. David Desmalchin with with Nolan again. And yeah, in the letter he makes the the claim that Oppenheimer is a, a Soviet agent. And then we get to the, you know, the, this thing of, oh, but, you know, if they call in a scientist, I'm screwed because Einstein hates me, you know. 
and the yeah you know the, <clears throat> actually yeah come to think of it the the right ha Hakon Chevalier Ch Chevalier I think yeah uh, was the the guy that he apparently still knows um, but but yeah the you know he's like ah you know careful about you know if, if you piss off Einstein he'll make a time machine go back in time and make an epic Command and Conquer spin-off happen. But but yeah, you know, the the Rami Malik shows up and like up to this point I was actually I was going to make the joke in the review itself that I was looking forward to seeing Rami Malik in a movie and I was still hoping that would happen at some point because you know before this he hadn't had but I think that might actually have been intentional like you know, the, and the first time he's like about to write down that the, the, I forget what it was, but someone made a crack at Oppenheimer's expense or something, and he's like taking the pen away. And then there's the other time with the, uh, I guess it's the, um, is that when they're doing the signing uh, petition thing? But yeah, uh, he gets some dialogue and he does a really great job. And, you know, it's this thing, you know, scientists do not want Strauss in government. And, yeah, you know, the, the, he, he stands up for Oppenheimer. Let's see. Yeah, and at this point I noted in my notes, uh, which is, you know, fairly logical place to note notes, the, you know, the women in the film, they have strong opinion, they express them, you know, they, they, they aren't really listened to, so they're, they're frustrated, which is, like, that's, you know, sadly, period accurate and accurate to this day as well, but I, it felt a little like a wasted opportunity. I, I wish, I, I hope that in the future he, he gets better. I, I guess the, it's not that there's never been, I do think that there's some really interesting stuff going on with Catwoman, for example, um, but yeah, I, I guess other than that, I'm not sure that I would say he does the best on female characters, and yeah, this is not really an exception. I do appreciate that Kitty does not mince words. And yeah, Strauss lost, just like Oppenheimer lost, it was the same tactic that he used himself. And Cobb confronts Oppenheimer with the deaths he, that his two nukes caused. Very, very harsh and, and cruel. Uh, you know, I like, obviously, it it's wrong, but he's doing it, it's, it's, vin you know, it's because he's being vindictive. And yeah, we get the white flash, we see Jean drown. And yeah, you know, the, the we get the thing about why Oppenheimer no longer supports the bomb. We tend to use the weapons we have. And that is sadly absolutely true and you know yeah like the atom bomb was one of the most like that uh, that's an extremely obvious case of it but you know and and it was the biggest at the time you know but yeah there's you know the the Yeah, there's there's a lot of of weapons that you know. Yeah, once once they're available, they're they're used. And yeah, Strauss is denied, and we get the detail that JFK voted against uh, Strauss, which I I believe is accurate. And and that's yeah, nice nice level detail. I wonder if the the QAnuts will try to square that one with Oh wait, yeah, no, that's not JFK. That's JFK Jr., right? It's just, yeah. Uh, I my I I can't really 
keep up with all the ridiculous things QAnon believe. I, th I think my head is entirely too securely fastened to the rest of my body to be able to do that. And yeah, we get the another mention of Oppenheimer being a martyr. And I really loved the, the you know, at, at first, like, uh, Elden, Alden, or, uh, <laughs> Alden Ehrenreich. I need to go to bed. And I'm almost done anyway. Uh, Alden Ehrenreich, Senate aide character, you know, early on, he's he seems very supportive of, of Strauss. But then here at the end, you know, he says, you know, since there, nobody else knows what was said there, is it possible that they weren't, that, that Oppenheimer and Einstein weren't talking about you? Maybe they were talking about something more important? <laughs> Absolutely love that. And, and yeah, the, the, um, um yeah, we, we get the thing with, you know, remember when he talked about a worry that it would destroy the world? I think it did, you know, and yeah, um, I, uh, I guess I ended up not copying it in, but uh, there was this excellent quote, there's something like, uh, yeah, there's more than one way to lose your life to a bomb, and that's yeah. That was uh, one of the one of the critic quotes, and yeah, that's an excellent way to to put it. And yeah, that is it for this section. So, final section notes taken before watching, and yeah. Um, Yes, I was wondering if the movie would acknowledge the fact that Oppenheimer had sex with his friend's wife in his friend's bed, got a pregnant girl married, or a married girl pregnant, I guess it is. Something that I learned by watching the documentary, YouTube Eric Epic Rap Battles. And yeah, so, so Dunkirk does not really address that Churchill was not against the Nazis from an ethical standpoint. He was worried about losing the British Empire. The ending of the movie Dunkirk does make him sound like some great heroic presence. Yes, I acknowledge they would have been difficult to fit in, but I don't think they needed to invoke Churchill at all. You know, I, I felt that the rest of the movie did a really great job just focusing on the people on the ground, the people actually experiencing it, and they were heroes. You know, it was Churchill who was a bastard. And, and yeah, so I really appreciate that this movie does acknowledge how monstrous the decision to bomb Hiroshima and Nagasaki was, and that Harry Truman did not at all have to make that decision. They could have won the war without using nukes, and they most definitely didn't have to nuke civilians. And yeah, so um, yeah, uh, critic. Yeah, I already mentioned the, right, actually, in earlier, in the review itself, I said I was going to talk about in this section. Yeah, the, the one critic said the sex scene, the critic, one user reviewer said the sex scene was awkward. And, yeah, um, in case you skipped ahead to here and didn't watch the previous, I'll just very quickly say, it was meant to be, it wasn't supposed to be, like, erotic. And, yeah, I, I think it was used well. And then this other user reviewer wrote, great story, but Hollywood never fails in throwing in the full front nudity. It wasn't full frontal. I don't know what... I'm guessing this is a person who just heard the term full front nudity and, and didn't really know what it meant, so they think it just means topless. Full frontal means, like, bush or balls, depending on but, but, no. Um, and then they go on to say, you know, th yeah, throwing in the full fun from the movie, to ruin the whole movie. Hollywood. Ooh, clever. Because, like, instead of Holly, it's hell. Wow. Because, because there's boobs in the movie. There's, there's boobs and a little butt. That's, that's hell. 
Wow. I mean, they do say go to go to hell for the company. I. Wow. Anyway, um, but yeah, you've done it again. Ruined an epic film. I hope you're proud of your perverted minds. Nudity in a film is perverted? Like, I get, like, in public, like, you know, don't walk naked down the street. An entire movie can be ruined by seeing someone naked? Puritanism ruins a film for you, not some bad skin. Um, yeah, but the, the, wow, that's, that's kind of sad. That, that someone, that the movie could be ruined for, but, but it's also just, it's fascinating to me. This person doesn't bring up the horrible things that the atom bomb, like the, the, you know, they don't say the movie was ruined by how awful bombing Hiroshima and Nagasaki were. They say, like, the thing that ruined the movie for them, they were, they were completely down with the, the melty face and, you know, being told that, that people burn to death and all this stuff, but boobies, no. Just like, holy crap. There's, there's just, yeah, conservatism melts your brain. Now, that is it for this video. So let me know, what is your favorite Nolan movie? Uh, do you, what, yeah, what did you think of this particular one? Um, do you hope that this turns out to be, like, would you be down for uh, Christopher Nolan directing a movie adaptation of one of the Red Alert video games? If you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two more links to stuff like one more playlist, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. Uh, let's see, I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiled thoughts on a movie. Recently mm -hmm. reviewed thoughts videos think about very similar to this one. In other words, if you're more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back account as well as catch me next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I will catch you next time.